The following is a local resident producer's program. The program content is the sole responsibility of the producer and does not necessarily reflect the views or policies of CATV2, Oshkosh Community Access Television, the City of Oshkosh, the Oshkosh Cable Television Advisory Commission, or Time Warner Cable. Hi everyone, welcome to another edition of I on Oshkosh. I'm Cheryl Hentz along with my co-host Tony Palmieri. And on this edition we're very pleased to welcome back uh, one gentleman who's been here a number of times in the past, uh, political science chair from UW Oshkosh, Jim Simmons, to my left. And uh, to his left, uh, someone who's never been here before, uh, but we're pleased that he is. And uh, he's a familiar face to most people, I think, in Oshkosh, Dan Rylance, who used to be the um, editorial page editor for Knight Ritter Newspapers, correct? Correct. And, uh, uh, Which is no more. No. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he used to do a lot of things with, with Tony I on uh, commentary yes. and, and, and his Jim. commentary website and that kind of yeah. thing. So welcome to both of you, you. Uh, for, for being here. Uh, we want to cover a variety of topics during the next hour, everything from city and county issues to mm -hmm. school board stuff and state and national concerns. And we should just state right up front that we're taping this on September 7th. The primary, of course, is coming up on September 12th. So this show will air at least one time before the primary. Mm -hmm. So if if you're watching it after the primary, parts of it may seem a little outdated. So forgive us for that. Mm -hmm. But anyway, you can see how accurate they were with their predictions, I guess, if, <laughs> if you're watching it after the primary. So um, well, let's, uh, let's just jump right into some city issues first. Um, you know, there's uh, a garbage fee that we're all paying right now mm -hmm. for the last quarter of, of this year, and it's uh, being proposed as part of a, a budget, uh, mm -hmm. one of the two budgets being put forth um, for mm -hmm. city council consideration. Um, city manager Dick Wallink is saying if that garbage fee is repealed and not put in the budget, there's going to be all kinds of hell to pay with the police and fire protection services in the city. What, do you think that it's going to be repealed? That's the easy one. I'll let Dan take the hard <laughs> questions about prediction. But I, I don't know of a citizen referendum anywhere that's not passed that reduces taxes or costs. I, I think it will pass overwhelmingly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no question the, about The that. real question is what, what the implications are for the city and how uh, city staff will have to go back to the drawing board to, to find the money to replace the, uh, the fee. Sure. Well, you know, I, I wish that um, the city council would have just said to Dick Wolink, look, <coughs> bring us two budgets, but one that's showing some, some cuts that aren't going to the heart of emergency services and, and protection mm -hmm. uh, for the citizens. I mean, it just seems like he's going for the, the easy money that he can cut, and, and it's, it's um, basically getting at people's heartstrings. You know, what do we want? Do we want to pay $10 a month? Or do we want to make sure that our homes and our families are, are protected? And, and that's how he's probably going to get them mm -hmm. in the end. Well, I don't think people are buying it. Uh, th do you think that anyone on the council who voted for this is in trouble? Well, the most, most obvious one is, is uh, Mrs. Shireman, because I believe on the last issue, when McHugh was trying to repeal it when he was elected, yeah. her, her famous statement to the voters was, trust me on this, that she was going to do something to repeal it. Mm. Uh, all three candidates up in April, by the way, of course, voted for it. That'd be Maddox, Shireman, and, and Bain. Uh, right. But yeah. I, 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 yeah, I, I would think voters will remember that. You think so, Jim? Well, I think um, one of the concerns of the newspaper, the, the lack of leadership. Yeah. yeah. One, and the questions you, that they've been, I mean, uh, Northwestern has a complete turnaround on the form of government, it seems. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, the feelings about uh, leadership and the council is asking questions insisting that the city manager do an audit do an internal study to see what can be done and the only response was to bring in the head of the league of municipalities to to do something which uh, anyone could have done if they read the municipality I mean, and of course they concluded that our spending is fine 
Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, if, if you compare us to other yeah. cities in terms of our tax rate and our spending and our number of employees, that's right. That's yeah. not something that's new. The question is, internally, uh, what, what's going to happen? What, what needs to be done without the, the $10 fee, which I'm convinced is going to go away? What are we going to do? Mm. And they wanted some advice. And what uh, the city manager provided doesn't give them that. Part of the failure should be hit against the council. The city doesn't even have a budget committee, standing committee. Uh, right. They should be proactive in the budget process. And instead, they're totally reactive. Uh, they do nothing. Uh, they should give the city manager a budget resolution like they do at other levels of government six months or three months before the budget. And here are the parameters of what we want you to do in the next budget. Mm -hmm. Instead, the city manager comes with the budget late, uh, you know, and they just roll over. Well, right. the, the city council doesn't even get the information right. that they need or, or, or at all. Right. Uh, you know, property that's sold, you know, without even the idea that, that uh, the, the uh, sale is going to provide the cost of the cleanup of the piece of property. I mean, those are the kinds of things that councilors need to know if they're going to be making any kind of but decision. The, but the council's been getting away with this kind of stuff since 1956. How come all of a sudden in 2006 these have become such big issues? Is it that I don't believe that this, co this council is qualitatively much worse than other councils. Isn't it because Madison has put cities in a much deeper straits now? Of course. I mean, yeah. cities are the child of the legislature, mm -hmm. and um, shared revenue has been declining. I mean, uh, the dollar amount has stayed the same, but its, it's buying power has been declining over time. Yeah. Uh, the restraints on cities is growing as uh, the legislature itself finds problems with its own budget. So, yeah. So if we had an elected mayor with executive power, um, how would that change things? Because the Northwestern now, who for generations has been opposed to that kind of thing, now they seem to be having a change of heart. <coughs> well, you, you really don't have, in effect, either form of government. You, you, you've got a city manager who doesn't have professional training or credentials that most city managers uh, normally have, and therefore the, the uh, kind of mm -hmm. professional uh, legitimacy. And you don't have an elected mayor either with the the legitimacy of having been chosen by the voters. Mm. And you, you have a part-time city council that, um, uh, you know, is accountable to everyone, which means that they're not really accountable to any specific person or any, any mm. portion of the city. So, mm. what, what about the proposal that uh, Paul Esslinger tried to get uh, on the ballot? Um, he, he tried this a few meetings back um, in I, as I think we all could have expected, uh, the city council didn't support his effort, but he was trying to get a referendum uh, put on the ballot uh, for an, a, an elected mayor, of course, which we have, but the mayor would have um, veto power. Um, what did you think about that? Because you've been a, a strong proponent uh, for years of changing the form of government. Well, that didn't. I mean, it, right. it certainly gave the mayor you know, functions and powers that the position hasn't had. Um, but I think a uh, good part of that failed simply because of the person advocating it. There, there was concern that uh, the position would be enlarged and then Paul would, would fill the position and of course of that mm -hmm. set off warning bells for Mm -hmm. A lot of leading figures in the city. Right. And, and actually, I stand corrected, it was actually McHugh who brought that forward, I believe. But certainly, uh, Esslinger was a, a strong uh, supporter of it, too. Um, it, and, you know, you're right, it didn't really do anything as far as changing the form of government. It was just another baby step that I think a lot of us have been trying to take in kind of failing at every effort that we make. We well, you know, d uh, th a veto really won't accomplish all that much. You, you need a p mayor with executive powers who can really uh, give some direction to city staff. Yeah. I mean, I can't imagine, you know, uh, you know, having one staff member who can't even count when it comes to contracts and, and that being acceptable or planning, which is done by the agency, informing the manager. So. I, a lot more needs to be done. But remember, too, that uh, the messenger is important because if you're giving the mayor executive power, everyone is going to want to know who that's going to be. And uh, mm -hmm. Dan, you were going to say something. Good candidates determine good government, not 
necessarily the system of government. And I think the city, whether we, we stay with the same system or go with another, we need better, well-qualified people to run. There are a lot of people out there that I think could make the system better, regardless of what system it was. Why do you think they're not running? Oh, I think it's a thankless job. Yeah. Um, I think under the present system, uh, you need good ID, uh, a lot of money. If it was an alderman, at least you could run like in one seventh or one eighth of the city, you could go door to door. Yeah. But to run citywide, uh, you need either a sugar daddy or, or a lot of your own money, I think, to be competitive. And I just don't think a lot of people have that. Right, mm. right. So you'd be uh, a proponent then of an aldermanic type form yeah, of absolutely. government? Absolutely. I've lived in four other cities the size of Oshkosh, all with a mayor with executive functions mm -hmm. and alderman form, and I think they run better. But you know what they say. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know, critics of that form of government have, have for years said, oh my I God, know. you can't have that. You're going to have horse right. trading. We've got horse trading going on right now. Right. And nobody wants to admit it. Right. So... How could we be any worse? Well, Jim, you were involved in the 90s, and I, I helped out, too, with the Citizens of Representative Democracy, which tried to get the mayor-alderman system back, and it, it failed in 96 and in 98. Can you see a scenario where something like that comes back? Well, remember, there was some semblance of a social movement back then. When we first got together, there were 30, 40 people yeah. at the first meeting. I mean, there were less people who were active later in actually doing right, the work. Right, of course. But... Um, but now, uh, people can become incensed about single issues like the, uh, the garbage fee or smoking in uh, mm. restaurants, but they don't seem to put all that all together in, in a package which calls for systemic change. Mm. Okay. So, in other words, you don't see this, this movement happening again? Well, you, you know yourself with the effort to get the referendum on the Iraq war on the ballot, yeah. how difficult it is in mm -hmm. uh, a city to take on an issue like that. Now, if, it, if it's um, uh, burn pits in your backyard or mm -hmm. whether or not you can park your SUV or your boat, that... Or, that or a garbage fee. Yeah. <laughs> 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 that, that grabs me. Right. Yeah. Well, I want to go back for just a second to, to what Tony was asking before about, you know, saying that this kind of stuff has been going on in local government for, for years, 50-some years. Mm -hmm. um, don't you guys think, though, that we're seeing more problems now? I mean, more mistakes being made, um, not so much by city council members, but by city staff, very well-paid city staff. Well, in the uh, past, remember, you had city managers who were you know, selected in national searches, and although they claimed to be administrators, they were policy makers. Mm -hmm. And they generally brought to the city, um, you know, a set of policies which, you know, I don't want to say the council rubber stamped them, but um, I don't mm -hmm. think past city managers would have tolerated, you know, the kind of, mm -hmm. you know, laissez faire attitude that, and the, you know, given the agency head so much. You know, ability to set the direction. Mm -hmm. So, other than electing different people on the council, and of course, to do that, we've got to have better qualified candidates. Um, you know, running. Um, what can we, as a, as a citizenry, do? Um, you know, we we see department heads like our city manager, and and you know, our, not just the city manager, but our city attorney making mistakes, like you had mentioned with the the contract uh, with PMI. Um, just little tiny things that that are really quite large things and we're seeing this over and over and over again so what what can we do short of electing somebody different to the council I like town hall meetings <coughs> and I know they're hard to set up but I would like to expose candidates in this city at the local level legislative level to an open forum where voters actually get a chance to ask them questions now you have your candidates on this mm -hmm. show league women and stuff but there's nowhere in Oshkosh where an average citizen can walk up to a mic, have a good moderator, and ask questions, get people involved in it. Now, I know people aren't going to go and all of that, but you got to get the citizens involved. I don't think they feel participatory. Mm -hmm. I think they're voyeurs. They're voter voyeurs. Mm -hmm. and, and one way is to get them to get out and participate. You know, Matt O'Malley, when he was on the city council Absolutely. a number of years ago, tried Absolutely. that, and, and it didn't go over too big. Well, well he, um, got, he got some... Some I disagree. I, I went to three or four of them, and there were... And what about the Fifth Tuesday forums? I have never gone game? to one, so I can't... I mean, they're 
I think they're good. I've been to uh, one or two, and yeah. and uh, you know, there's there's a nice turnout, but it's nowhere near what it probably right. should be. Right. And and I too went to a couple of Matt O'Malley's, mm -hmm. and I guess when I say they didn't go over too well, it's when you look at the size of our community, of uh, you, you know, people just sure. when you talk to people on the street, they're they're upset, they're they're fired up about things, they want to do something about it, but when it comes down to actually doing something about it or going to a meeting to talk about it. Difficult you know, right. the apathy rears its yeah. ugly head again. Apathy is a huge problem. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about something that people are not apathetic about, and it's shifting gears here to UW Oshkosh. Uh, the, the campus screens uh, are bringing in a fellow named Kevin Barrett, who's a lecturer at UW-Madison. He uh, believes that 9-11 was an inside government conspiracy. The Republicans, especially in the legislature, wanted him fired. The UW-Madison provost decided that his course was fine. He's still, he's still teaching. Uh, Campus Greens on Oshkosh are bringing him in. Jim, you were quoted in the paper as saying this is a bad time to bring in some, someone like that. What well, that I mean? think Barrett is an embarrassment. I, I don't think that I'm unusual among the faculty in thinking that uh, you know his views on this issue don't reflect uh, the opinion of, of most faculty. And uh, I do think that the university has become a whipping boy in the governor's race. Mm -hmm. I mean, they found any number of reasons to dislike us, and uh, uh, both the Democratic candidate and the Republican candidate are, are making policy, uh, p taking policy position that sound like threats. I mean, but isn't there a bigger principle here? If we establish the precedent that legislators can essentially bully the administration into firing someone, essentially because he gave a radio interview. I mean, no one knew who this guy was until he gave a radio interview in Milwaukee. Doesn't that set a really bad precedent, regardless of what his views are? They're not firing some, him since he really doesn't have a position. He, he's a, an instructor of a single class uh, mm -hmm. in contemporary Islam. I mean, he's a gypsy professor who teaches at various places. And he's been seeking out publicity, and he seems to glory in the fact that uh, and he, he uses the UW system to gain attention for his views. Dan, what's your view? So what? Isn't that what universities are all about? I, I hope faculty, most faculty, want him on campus. And I think if you're embarrassed with him, maybe you should have a panel of people who disagree with him that can dissect and discuss his presentation afterwards. We're living in a society where other people's ideas are being squashed. Yeah. We're, we're all supposed to think alike and act alike. We're, we're in a conformist society. And universities are not supposed to be a conformist society. They're supposed to be open to different ideas. I, I want him on campus in the same way I want Dan Brown talking about the Da Vinci Code on campus or Von Daniken and Chariots of the Gods, that somehow civilization is a product of al alien intelligence. There is nothing serious about you know, what, he, what he has to say. And if you look at the evidence that he presents, which you can find, you don't have to see it on campus, you can find it online. And not only that, there are all the sites that debunk it as well. If you want someone serious to talk about this, then let's bring someone with some expertise and credentials. You don't have uh, some third weight ad hoc uh, faculty member whose, whose field of study is African studies to do that. You guys live in an ivory tower. Your journals, <laughs> you, you, you write to each other, you communicate to each other. No one understands what you're talking about or what you're writing about. And so you bring in someone who's different and oh, by heavens, I'm embarrassed that he has no credentials. You know, can't we play with ideas? Do we all have to have PhDs in a, a certain area that you can only talk about political science? Tony can all, only talk about communication? Can't we just go to a university forum at night and listen to something that's kind of crazy and, and off? So what? What is the big deal? The, the students have invited him in, or at least one student group has invited him in. No one's going to turn him down. Anyone who wants to come in here should. I know, but don't you think the chancellor overreacted? I mean, he, he sent out a, a notice a, a, reminding everyone that no campus resources are being used for this. We're not spending any money. And then um, a, a subtle threat to cancel the event if there weren't the proper civility uh, protocol followed, as if the campus greens would violate civility right. protocol. Yeah. And then the, the last thing he did in that note, which I found to be just in incredible, he goes and invites another speaker to campus for November who's written a book called, I think, Why Smart People Believe Weird Things. I mean, isn't this like overkill? I mean, one guy, one guy with a wacky, th perhaps wacky theory is coming to campus, 
And w th doesn't that seem like a little overkill to, to like protect ourselves against the legislature? That's what I'm concerned about, Jim. The fact that we're bending over backwards to make sure that the legislature doesn't get upset with us as if they don't speak nonsense on the floor of the legislature well, sure. every day. I mean, uh, many of the uh, people who are most critical of the university and Barrett are as extreme and wacky in some of the things that yeah, they sure. value or believe as, as Barrett. But uh, we're not inviting them either. Oh, one last thing, Cheryl. Sure. Now that we know that everyone in Oshkosh is concerned about academic standards, right. what do you both feel about the fact that the city of Oshkosh joined the EAA in giving the key to the city to a guy who has two fake degrees from a diploma mill? And even when that was pointed out, they still lent their name to this guy. You know, other CEOs have been fired from their jobs as CEOs for having fake degrees on their resume. This guy ends up with a key to the city of Oshkosh. And there's something absurd about that. Faculty Senate should have passed a resolution say they were embarrassed <laughs> that he was <laughs> <getting> <laughs> a library degree. Well, <laughs> 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 so. well, Jim is a much better faculty senate president, <laughs> faculty senate president than I was. Oh, of course. But, but, if, I, <laughs> but, if, I, but if I was still president of the faculty yeah. senate, we would, uh, I'd put that resolution on the floor. Yeah. In, a, in a campus town, to have a guy getting recognized for a key to the city of Oshkosh, who bought, this guy bought two degrees and did nothing. Isn't that outrageous? Yeah, I, I, we've had a lot of conversation about that too. But again, we didn't invite the, the individual to the city. And, and, and frankly, in the business world, if you're successful, um, you know, Pumping up your credentials isn't seen as <laughs> such, <laughs> such a problem. Uh, on the university... <laughs> well, that's <laughs> the thing. This guy, Kevin Barrett... you looking for a job. Here's the thing. This Kevin Barrett character, yeah. for all his flaws, he has a legitimate, real PhD <laughs> from UW-Madison, <laughs> right? And, and yet he gets this kind of flack for having a very unpopular idea. I don't believe his idea, but, I mean, the First <laughs> Amendment protects unpopular yeah, ideas. Sure. And, and the university ought to be a place where he can talk about it. And it is. Yeah. Well, good. Yeah. We're providing him. <laughs> yeah, well, good. I but mean, you're embarrassed about it. I, he has freedom of speech, so do I. <laughs> yeah. I find him an embarrassment. Okay. Right. Okay. okay. All right. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's move back into uh, <laughs> actual politics. <laughs> um, we've got a um, race for district attorney here in uh -huh. Winnebago County coming up. Um, two Republicans are going to be squaring off... Um, in next week's primary, uh, Christian Gossett and Michelle Pennywell, and then they'll go against, uh, the winner of that will go against Democratic candidate Joe Manske in November. Um, first, what do you guys each think of uh, this race? What do you think is going to happen there? I have not followed that closely, to be honest with you. Uh, I come from a state where carpetbaggers are not allowed. You have to live in this district or in the county or the city uh, for a year or two before you run. To run for a constitutional office, you have to live five years in the state. So mm -hmm. I, I have problems with carpetbaggers. Pennywell is the carpetbagger. And Lennon was a carpetbagger before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Seems to be that they ought to live before they're elected. So mm -hmm. I, I guess that's my only comment on it. Okay. Jim? Well, y you mentioned two Republicans. I mean, I think Gossett is clearly Republican, but there's been some question about Pennywell and mm -hmm. her past contributions. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's given to both gubernatorial candidates in the mm -hmm. past. and wouldn't be the first time a Democrat thought it might be easier and, and to get elected. appointed by Doyle, right? Yes. Yes. That's, yep. yeah. that, that doesn't necessarily mean anything and right. actually might benefit her because since there's no real contest on the Democratic side, she right. could gain from a crossover vote. Sure. Mm -hmm. Well, there's been some flap yeah. surrounding Pennywell, um, and, and it doesn't have anything to do with her being a carpetbagger. <laughs> it's <laughs> but, not a um, Wisconsin term. Um, <coughs> you know, there's, there have been a couple issues. Number one, she's got a fiancé who's currently working as an assistant DA in the, in the DA's office, uh, Doran Visti. Um, when she was on this show, she said that he would remain there and she'd have no problem, you know, as his supervisor, that she wouldn't handle any issues that he may be involved in from a personnel standpoint and so forth. Um, just a couple weeks later when she appeared at the uh, candidates forum for the League of Women Voters, um, she said that if she was elected, he'd be transferring out of the office. Mm -hmm. um, so there's some confusion there about which way it really is. And then, of course, the most recent thing is her fiancé, again, Doran Visti, filed an open records request for um, a copy of Christian Gossett's resume, and uh, he wasn't told that that was going to be given out to anyone. 
He's filed a grievance uh, against um, current uh, DA Bill Lennon. And Bill Lennon said, hey, there's, this is not part of Mr. Gossett's personnel file, and his resume just happened to be sitting, just happened to be <laughs> yeah. sitting in a pile of resumes in my desk. Oh, um, after Gossett's been working in the office for four <laughs> or five years, you know, I don't know what kind of filing, I, I think this says something about Bill Lennon's filing system. But, um, you know, wh what do you each think about those two issues? Well, you know, I, I, I support uh, open records law. I also support, you know, the person's right to, uh, appe you know, appeal if they feel that, um, I mean, the, f the fact is that there was no basis for appeal so that ultimately Lennon would have given it out. It would have taken some time. I think Pennywell clearly wanted to focus on the fact that um, her opponent had been a policeman and he had lost his position or been fired and and th hope that that would reflect badly on him. Um, to tell you the truth, like you, I haven't been paying as much attention to this race as I should because, you know, neither of them seem to be the personality or the stature that you'd want on a prosecutor. I mean, you can say what you want about Joe Paulus, but you you had to fear him in the in the courtroom. And um, facing either those these two or the incumbent would not be as. Uh, mm harrowing an experience. <laughs> now, <laughs> you, you would hope that, that Paulus would have <laughs> followed through with prosecutions of people he should be prosecuting and those he shouldn't in ways that, you know. He well, speaking of Paulus, before we, have, before we have to make a prediction on this race, but speaking of Paulus, he was in court recently and he looks like he's going to get another two years lopped onto the federal sentence. Uh, is this closure? I, I suspect the Northwestern hopes it isn't. I mean, it's the Paulus Northwestern. I mean, I'm, I'm getting tired of, of seeing him on the front page and editorials and stories. I mean, it, it's overkill as far as I'm concerned. But is it conceivable that it was Joe Paulus and Mitch Sheerlin? They're essentially the only two that got nailed in mm -hmm. this, right? Yes. Is it conceivable that these are the only two guys that had their hands in the cookie jar over these years? I don't buy it. Yeah. It's unlikely. It's I think unlikely. I think a judge that just recently got elected probably had something to do but with it. But doesn't it right? seem, Jim, like there's some incompetence that they made these plea deals with Paulus and he turned nobody over? Yeah. I mean, apparently Paulus gave them no one. At least there's been no charges put forward yeah. yet. Yeah. And then you had a good uh, statement on your website about Paulus' apology letter. Yeah. Well, it just doesn't seem yeah. sincere. I mean, yeah. he, he, you know, he waits until <laughs> yeah. a few days or a half a week or whatever before he uh -huh. makes his first court appearance here. He had two years to, to do this if he truly wanted to apologize to the people of this county. Um, it was as calculating, I believe, as he has always been. Yeah. And I don't think that he has changed one single bit since he's been in prison. But do you think that people in this county will ever have confidence in the justice system after that? I hope so, and, but I think the superficialities that Cheryl just mentioned about yeah. what the issues are for these two candidates doesn't make it look real good. I mean, how, how do I determine a vote on, on these little petty little things? Mm -hmm. There's no substance here, I don't think. Right. Well, and I guess my problem with, with the open records request um, is I, too, am a huge proponent of, of open records. Um, I think all of us at this table probably are, but it, she didn't file it. No. Her fiance filed yeah, it. And, and it does, well. it, it mm. kind of muddies the waters that's a little bit. That's petty. <laughs> yeah. It really is. I, I don't know how the election is going to come out, but clearly I think um, uh, he has uh, more of the Republican base. He's clearly more conservative, consistently conservative on a range of issues than she's. Many of them that don't have anything to do with the DA position. Mm -hmm. So. It really depends upon turnout, and mm -hmm. I mean, actually, identifying her as a, a Democrat might help her. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> okay. okay. You know, also on the on the uh, county level, the county's having budget troubles. Also, of course, and last year, Mark Harris really pushed hard for a, an increase in the sales tax, and the county board found a way to balance their budget allegedly balanced their budget without raising the sales tax. Harris is going to come back with this again this year, I would imagine, don't you think? I do, and, and the garbage tax and the sales tax are all reflections of yeah. a tighter budgetary situation at the local level, exacerbated in part do you, do you by think he makes a good? Do you think he makes a strong case for the sales tax, though? Well, I don't. I, I think sales tax in one county in the Fox River Valley is, is, is a hard one to sell. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think, Jim? Well, 
again, he has to sell the board on this. And the question is, what services are they going to relinquish and how painful is it going to be? I mean, the more painful, um, the more, more like likely they are yeah. to accept a sales tax. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the board might ultimately go with a smaller sales tax yeah. than the, um, the county executive wants and then, of course, it's likely to grow. Uh, the, actually, lately, the only thing that I would like about a sales tax is that, it, and this is kind of a political point, it would it would prove that we've been lied to for years about the EAA attendance. Because what a lot of people are saying, if you have the sales tax in, when all those people come in for EAA, mm -hmm. you'll get a lot of revenue. Mm -hmm. What they'll find in the first year is that the amount of revenue we get from EAA is not that great. Mm -hmm. Because there are not three quarters of a million people here right. at, that time, at that time of year. Well, no, but what, what you do have is however many are here, whether it's 100,000 or 200,000, um, they're still buying meals every yes. day. Yes, oh, yeah, you'll and, get, and, and yeah. Yeah. Kind of we'll, we'll get a revenue boost, mm -hmm. but it won't be, Joe Mail used to talk about millions and millions of dollars just from EAA. Mm -hmm. No. That ain't gonna happen. No, that's yeah. not gonna happen. But having said that, he's gonna have a tough sell on this board, isn't he? Oh, yeah, I think yeah. he will. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, on the, but then they've gotta make some tough decisions. Yeah. And Walnick's garbage fee is going down the garbage. <laughs> I mean, uh, that was a sale. At, um, so, I mean, this is going to happen. You know, you're talking about fees and sales taxes. School board's going to be dealing with this. Mm -hmm. County's going to be dealing with city. That This decade is not is going to be very tough to support good services at the local level with the yeah. revenue that they're allowed. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it sounds like the problem's not going to be solved in Madison. I doubt it. Probably be exacerbated right. in Madison. Yeah, that's where the problem is, right? These wacky tax freeze ideas and so on. Well, of course, you you have to remember though that this began in the early '90s when the state legislature picked up the cost of the public schools to yeah. reduce the burden on the property taxpayer, right. um, and that pitted the schools against the universities, against uh, healthcare costs, against transportation, and and all the rest, and the legislature after windfalls in tax revenues um, haven't seen th those same increases and they can't fund all that they want to fund. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Cheryl. Um, on the subject of county board, we've got uh, 38 members on a county board and, and we've now got a committee formed to um, study the size of the county board and, and make some determinations as to whether or not that's the right size or um, too large. And um, along with that, um, we have got Progress Oshkosh, which has formed a subcommittee, and they're going to be um, later this month, I guess. Uh, uh, in fact, I just talked with someone from there earlier today. And um, on the 20th of September, they're going to be officially rolling out their campaign. They're starting a petition drive to get some kind of a referendum on the April ballot um, to cut the size of the county board in half. Um, do each of you think the size is just right, or should it be cut? And if so, is 19 the, the magic number? <laughs> well, I, I would favor a smaller board, but there's no magic number. I mean, I'm not sure what a study would produce. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, how would the study be conducted so that you look at board size and spending, or board size and the numbers of uh, complaints and grievances? I, there, there really isn't any magic number. Um, it, would policy okay. in the county change dramatically with a smaller board, which is a hope of progress on right, but is there, is there a commission, so. Jim? The, the state of New Hampshire has the largest legislature in the country and the lowest taxes. The Wisconsin Taxpayer Association did a study. I don't know how they calculated it, but the larger county boards mm -hmm. are in counties with lower taxes. Sure. So is is, as a social scientist, is th you can't make I, that correlation? I don't think you can make that correlation. I mean, uh, you can s pick specific states and, and attempt to do that, but I don't think it holds mm -hmm. up. But um, it's it also low in when it comes to taxes, substantially lower mm -hmm. than uh, Wisconsin and the county boards there are five, six members. Hmm. Dan, what do you think? Two points. We've just talked before about the inefficiency of the Common Council, ineptness in budget and stuff. Um, I think the 38 county board is probably more efficient with a strong committee structure than the common council is. Uh, oh, absolutely. Second, I know who my supervisor is. He's Bill Wingren. Mm -hmm. He comes to my house. He's always accessible. Now, if you increase his district by two times or three times, I'm not sure the types like Bill Wingren are going to be as accessible as they were before. I'm not even sure if they're going to run before. And then there'll be bigger money in financing half the number of candidates yeah. 
So I think there's some advantages in the size of the board that we have. Now, I don't know whether it's I don't know, no magic number, it maybe could be smaller than 38, but I think they're pretty efficient. Mm -hmm. They have a good committee structure, which a legislative body ought to have, and at least my supervisor is very accessible to me. And I think Bill is, um, you know, I think he's a great supervisor. Um, he, he's shy when it comes to cameras. We've tried to get him on, <laughs> yeah. on this show. You tried to get him mm -hmm. on commentary when it was going, and he's just, for whatever reason, he's camera shy, and yeah. he won't come on. Yeah. Um, but he loves the show. Wingren <laughs> so, is atypical. You don't see county board members going door no. to door. No, and, and that I mean, was what I was going to say. In fact, most of the, the races are uncontested. Yeah. And well, his is uncontested. Yeah. Yeah. Well, most don't even know who their county board yeah. supervisor is. But isn't it also true, Jim, that with a smaller board with a county executive system, doesn't the county executive become more powerful with a smaller board? I'm not sure that's a good thing. Not necessarily. You don't think so? Well, not He's got fewer people to have to persuade. Don't the special interests become more powerful? I mean, I find it um, interesting that chambers of commerce which a lot of Progress Oshkosh are made up of Chamber of Commerce type of individuals, they want a smaller board. Mm -hmm. Why? It's easier to get something through seven common council members. And easier to fund. Yeah. I mean, I really think that if the, if the county board were seven people, Parkview Nursing Home would be at the old uh, Mercy Medical right now. Mm -hmm. They would have gotten something like that through a seven-member board easily. But with the committee system, where it had to be hashed out, mm -hmm. what exactly what we're doing, like on Parkview Nursing, didn't the larger board with the committee structure end up with a better, better policy outcome? Would, it, would we have done that with a smaller? Well, I'm not so sure about the policy outcome, and I'm not so sure that that was affected by the size of the, the size of the board specifically. I, I, you know, I looked at boards in different states at different sizes, and mm -hmm. special interests are. <laughs> fairly important everywhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's fueled by apathy, it's fueled by yeah. lack of en engagement, it's fueled by the simple fact that uh, elections are increasingly expensive and responsive to interest money. But you know what we saw in the last election, the last elections for county board, anyone who challenged an incumbent and who ran a vigorous campaign, Donna Lori against Harold Stanky, Jeff Hall against uh, PJ Sunquist, yeah. and there were I think one or two others, mm -hmm. The challengers all won. Mm -hmm. Now, you add 2,000 people to the district, it becomes that much more difficult to unseat the incumbent, doesn't it? I don't know. We've had fairly competitive uh, council races recently. I mean, given the fact that uh, these people are running at large citywide. Um, yeah, but it's, yeah. Not, it's not common to get incumbents out of the council, is it? I mean, we've had some incumbents defeated. I remember Paul Weimer was defeated a few years ago. But incumbents say... Stan Bauer, uh, yeah, Del Antonio... But after they were in for a long period of time, right? right. Yeah, the, but, but I think um, the point is that, you know, even though we've got all these challengers, I mean, look at when I ran two years ago, mm -hmm. or a year and a half ago, uh, there were, what, 21 candidates, 19 candidates, yeah. something like that, mm -hmm. and yet we had incumbents getting reelected. Yeah, so. that's true. The one last thing I want to raise about the county board size, isn't it a myth, Jim? Uh, this is what scares me. A lot of people believe that if you reduce the size of the board, you're necessarily going to spend less money on county government. That's a myth, right? Yeah, of course. You may end up spending more money. You could. Yeah, and see, I'm afraid that's going to get lost in the debate. People are going to think, oh, 19 instead of 38, smaller government, less money. That's not necessarily the case. Well, yeah. the, the same is true of uh, Mayor Alderman's system. Sure. I mean, yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's no I mean, magic. There's no magic formula. It depends right. upon who's elected. And, and in fact, exactly. uh, uh, you know, the mayoral exactly. systems tend to have higher taxes yeah. in this state. Mm -hmm. than okay. All right. Sure. All right. Um, let's talk about some um, state races now. Um, we've got uh, Julie Pung Leschke uh, running against Larry Didlow in, in the primary. Mm -hmm. I think we all pretty much know who's, who's going to win that. Um, and that means that we're going to have Leschke running against Gordon Hintz. Um, Probably. And, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you know, and, and yet Leschke has, has not, um, sh you know, she's not answered any bipartisan type questions about uh, campaign finance reform. Uh, her website, as of this taping, has, is virtually non existent. Um, and yet it's been online, it's been active yeah, for, for months and months since she announced, but there's nothing there. Um, you know, how seriously can voters really take her 
if she's not willing to step up to the plate and say where she stands on some of these issues? Well, it's early. She's only in a primary thing. Mm -hmm. uh, historically, this is the race of the mayor's kids. Both of the, both the hints and, and That's right. are, are, are offspring of former mayors. So I, I call this the, the mayor kids race, huh? Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, just for trivia. Uh, I think Leschke has, I don't know whether you followed Catherine Harris on, on television, her embattled uh, race in the U.S. Senate in Florida. Mm -hmm. But I think that the two parallel each other very closely. They're both running as kind of citizen type people, not party people. But their platform, in both cases, is hardcore Bush tax republicanism, less yeah. tax republicanism. And I, I think, you know, that's going to be a really good issue. Uh, Hintz, on the other hand, has been very quiet. Uh, he's been running since 2004. Uh, has he said anything since 2004? I haven't heard anything. Uh, you'd think he'd be more issue oriented than that. So I think he's playing a very quiet, uh, non-confrontational mm -hmm. sort of thing. Uh, it'll be very, I think the race will be close. I think the governor's race and turnout will be a factor in who wins or who loses. But, uh, you know, it's the mayor's kids race. We'll see what happens. <laughs> well, in something like the 54th district, Jim, it, we're going to have just the Republican and just the Democrat. No third party candidates or independent. Each candidate starts off with what? Do, do they each start off with 30% of the vote as, as a given? As a given. Okay, so it's basically 30 30 just before anyone even does anything. Well, actually, it's probably. 40 40. Yeah, it's probably closer to 40 40. Okay, so they're really struggling over, say, 20% of sure. uh, mm -hmm. undecideds? Mm -hmm. All, right. All right, so do you think, has that, has that group of undecideds in Oshkosh moved in a more progressive direction in the last 10 years? They're, they're starting 30 30 with people who feel strongly uh, one way or another in, right. in terms of partisan identification, and then mm -hmm. they start with. Um, another 10% of the electorate that leans that way and doesn't need much persuasion. Okay. You know, so um, then they're competing over 20% of the electorate that can move either way. So Turnout uh, matters, um, you know, mobilization matters, effectiveness of organization yeah, for, matters. For people, in that, for people in the 54th district who are undecided, they plan on voting in that race, what's going to swing them? Maybe it's not even issues that will swing no, them. I, it's contact. Tr truthfully, um, you know, uh, Greg Underheim was a much more moderate Republican than Julia's. is. I yeah. mean, she, oh, she, sure. she is running a campaign as just a Wisconsin housewife, you know, you know and, and so on. And, um, you know, a, a family woman and so on. Um, but she is really far more conservative than Greg was. Mm -hmm. um, but Greg worked extremely hard to to gain election and re-election. He was constantly at meetings, providing service, going, doing the doors, uh, and he built up a certain amount of uh, credibility. And uh, you know, you know, over time, I, I think he would have been a fairly effective candidate. And if I were predicting, I think he would have been re-elected narrowly. Mm -hmm. uh, in this race, mm -hmm. I don't think Julie will work that hard. I think that uh, she'll be far more dependent upon her handlers, those people who mm -hmm. are working in her campaign. Much more money will be spent. Oh yeah. You can expect that um, the state Republican and Democratic committees and the various interest groups are going to concentrate on this race because it's extremely close, so it's going to be extremely nasty whether or not the two candidates want it to be, and I don't think they do. But I, they'll be forced in that position probably. And um, I think that m maybe, in, in my mind, uh, just the fact that Gordon tends to work harder at it. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. Dan, you brought in um, an ad that you got. Yeah. Uh, um, what did you want to say about that? Well, we are talking about going after that 20 or 30 percent. And I evidently have been targeted by Leschke as a senior, <laughs> which I am. And so her, her plea to me is that she wants to eliminate the t tax on pensions in Wisconsin. Now I'm thinking pensions. Yeah, I guess I get a pension. I'm so so. I'm assuming she's thinking that I'm paying state income tax on Social Security and any other things. Mm -hmm. And so she says Julie wants to eliminate this retirement tax that penalizes seniors who stay here in Wisconsin. And I'm among the hardest hit by taxes and wasteful government spending. So I'm looking at this. And I'm saying, well, first of all, what's the fiscal note on repealing tax pensions? Five million, ten million, twenty million a year. And if she repeals it, how is she going to make up the revenue? And on everything she says, she's not going to make up the revenue on anything. She's just going to cut. 
And when she gets to UW system or K through 12, she wants more efficiency, more accountability. We've been hearing this for the last, what, eight years? Mm -hmm. yeah. So she's, she's gonna be, a, she's, Jim's right, she's a much, she's, not, she's a, not a moderate, re she's gonna cut things. And this is an example of this. Now I'm not voting in the Republican primary in the 12th, so she got me on the wrong list. But anyway, clearly I'm targeted as a senior in Oshkosh that I should consider voting for it because she's going to repeal the Wisconsin tax on pensions. Hmm. But, but she's going to maintain and expand funding on senior care. So probably, I mean, it's benefit in both ways. Yeah, you keep yeah. it home and yeah, 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 senior care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and she'll pay for it with a state garbage fee. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, there's a there's a very nasty race going on for attorney general on both sides. Actually, I'm sorry, but before okay. we go to that, can we stay on assembly oh, for sure. just a moment? Because sure. some of our viewers are in the 53rd assembly okay. district. Oh yes. Oh um, yes. Yes. You know, there's a, a chunk north of town that that is in in that uh, assembly That's district, right. and and there we've got Carol Owens, a longtime incumbent, um, running against um, Dick Spanbauer, Dick Spanbauer. Mm -hmm. and you know there is no Democratic challenger there, so whoever wins that race on the primary date of September 12th will have that position. Um, have either of you followed that race at all? Well, here's another case where you know I mentioned the case of prosecutor that. Democratic crossover might be uh, of hmm. importance. You notice that uh, the paper has begun to pick up on the fact that uh, Spanbar wasn't always a Republican. He claims he mm -hmm. was a conservative mm -hmm. Democrat and his party had become too liberal. But I think he himself is playing to uh, that, that potential crossover vote. Mm -hmm. And in, in many ways, I think uh, Carroll has become something of an albatross for the Republicans. So even those Republicans who are as conservative as she is. I just don't think she can be beat. I don't either. No. You know, she's 75 years old. There's a solid core of people yep. in that 53rd <laughs> district. I, I agree with you, but yeah. the district is changing. I mean, it's yeah. becoming more That's urban. True. It's becoming yeah. more, mm -hmm. you know, it's not the rural yeah. district that she was first elected to. So I, maybe not this time around, and maybe not Spanbauer, but soon. Yeah, well, I you know, actually, that does lead to the... See, I think there's a lot of people that want to vote for Peggy Lautenschlager in the Democratic primary, and so they can't then cross over and vote for Dick Spanbauer in yeah. that seat. That's, that's one thing about Wisconsin's primary law. We call it an open primary, correct? Meaning that you can vote in any party, but a lot of people don't experience it as open because they go to it and they say, you know, I want to vote for the Republican in one race, the Democrat in another. You can't do that. Are there any states where you can do that? That's not... Th these are... Party primaries. Party primaries. They, they yeah, yeah. The, the ways in which the parties nominate their candidates. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. um, in fact, in most states, um, you have to register by party. Yeah. yeah. But I really think that's going to hurt Dick Spanbauer because there's a ton of people, especially in that Falk Lautenschlager race for Attorney General, that really want to vote in that race. Uh -huh. And so he can't get their votes at that point, no. right? Uh, again, you, you may be overestimating how important the uh, state attorney general race is. I mean, no, I, I understand this is Lautenschlager territory, former DA, right. and, and so on, but it, it may not be as important as you might think. Well, let's talk about that race for a second. Um, it's been very nasty. Um, everyone knows that Kathleen Falk is running because Lautenschlager got caught drunk driving. They don't think she'll be a strong candidate in November. Do you think Falk can win that one? I think Falk's a spoiler. Uh, she helped Doyle win the the primary four years ago in the, in the Democratic uh, race for governor. Um, I think she has a chance to win, unfortunately. I, I, I would support Lautenschlager, but uh, I, I think uh, hardcore Democrats are worried that, like you just said, that yeah. Lautenschlager is vulnerable in the fall and they don't want to have a Republican Attorney General. Well, now they've guaranteed she'll be vulnerable in the fall. <laughs> That's true. Because, you know, Falk is the one now that ran the drunk driving ad. Yeah, yeah. Right. Which is just terrible. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah. for anyone who's seen it, um, I saw it on your website yeah. uh, first, oh. and then I, I saw it on uh, yeah. television, I think, yesterday for yeah. the first time. It's terrible. The other thing she's pulled out, I think, to totally embarrass Lautenschlager, is the fact that Wisconsin is the only state out of all 50 in which the initial drunk driving offense is not a felony. Right? It's, a, it's a, in Wisconsin... Um, it's an ordinance violation. We're the only state in the nation where it's not a criminal charge. Falk pulls that one out all of a sudden. You know, the implication being that the attorney general would be in jail sure. if we were like 49 other, other states. 
It's been a pretty low campaign, don't you think? It, I don't think she's in the race because of Peg Lautenschlager's drunk driving. I think she's in the race because um, Peg and the governor were at odds on a number of issues, yeah. and that the governor and Falk used that as a springboard right. um, to replace someone who really hasn't been a team player within no. the state administration. No. Um, there's a little bit of desperation, too, when you have Falk doing this commercial. Everyone knows about it. It's not yeah, as, if, yeah. it's not as yeah, if the exactly. Republicans aren't making a case right. Everyone against Lauten Sager. Yeah. So if she needs to do this, she may feel that she's behind. Well, really, outside of Madison, who knows Kathleen Falk? She doesn't have a lot of statewide. I mean, she ran for governor that, mm -hmm. the, that time, and she was public intervener. But I don't think her name ID no. is no. as high no, as Lauten Sager. Hardly. No. The power of incumbency. Right. Who do you think will win that one in the primary? I hate to make predictions like this. <laughs> Go ahead. No, Do it. Dan. You, no, no, no. It's your turn. <laughs> you That's my turn. I, I wanted the garbage field. Yeah. Did you? The easy. Oh, that was. <laughs> that was yeah. cool. I think. I think. Uh, I'll predict. I think. <laughs> I think Lautenschlager is going to pull that out um, because I do think a lot of people in the state think that she's been good on open records, yeah. environmental issues, and things like that. And I think a lot of people want someone to put a check on Doyle. Yeah. The general election is something else. Yeah. Jim and I have just caucused. We yeah. agree. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, I, and I think Lautenschlager thinks she's going to win it, too, because i um, very happy to uh, tell viewers that she has agreed to appear on this program, yes. oh. and uh, she'll be here in a couple of weeks. So well, it'll be interesting to see if she keeps that invitation if she loses. If she loses, yeah. yeah. Well, she, well, she well, must be confident, because normally if uh, someone runs a negative ad like that, you, you respond immediately and within 24 hours. I haven't seen it, mm -hmm. so she must not feel it's having the effect. Um, well, and, and like you said, everybody's everybody known knows. about yeah. this drunk driving thing since since it occurred. It made national news, for God's sake, back then. So, yeah. um, it, it and I think that we as a as an electorate are rather forgiving, mm -hmm. even if we shouldn't be in some cases. I think we have. Uh, um, a, a reputation for being forgiving, and I just don't think that that's going to play as much a factor in this election as Falk might think. Yeah, well, or especially in Wisconsin, we're much more forgiving of drinking than most <laughs> 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 yeah. It's true. Go I ahead, thought John. a DUI was the state motto. Um, okay, two referendum questions on the on the ballot mm -hmm. in in the fall. I, one that would essentially create a constitutional amendment to make gay marriage, civil unions even, impossible. One, to bring back the death penalty. Are these just political ploys, mostly Republican political ploys, to get out of vote? Absolutely. And one is dangerous because if it wins, it goes into the Constitution. The other one is simply advisory. Why dangerous? We don't want to put in the Constitution things that take away people's rights. Yeah. The Constitution is a benevolent sort of general sort of thing that, that gives rights. Uh, can you name anything in the Wisconsin Constitution no. that takes away anyone's no. rights? I, I and Jim, know. in the UW, we yeah. are losing people because of the lack of domestic partner benefits in the system. I mean, a lot of people like to laugh that off, but that's, that's the brain drain, isn't it? No, I, I understand that. I'm not sure that that's going to play terribly well because everyone's losing benefits and yeah. they're yeah. It, it, it's not as if there's a groundswell for regaining benefits or forcing companies like Walmart to provide their yeah, their true. employees with benefits yeah. or to go with a single payer plan of any kind. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's simply that we all should be suffering in the same pool. Right. So I don't think that's going to play well. Now, every one of these marriage amendments in other states where it's come to a statewide referendum has won. Yeah. Um, most cases overwhelmingly recently somewhat more narrowly. Um, if um, Republicans in the legislature hadn't overplayed their hand, this one probably would be a dead pipe cinch. Mm -hmm. But uh, the language that they put in, expanding it to potentially yeah. um, heterosexuals in various forms of civil union, mm -hmm. um, that provided the opposition with whatever chance they have yeah. to, okay. to win this time. Okay, I think Wisconsin is going to be the first state to defeat that. Uh, what, what about uh, death penalty? It's advisory. Um, I have no feeling on that at all. I, 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 we haven't had the death penalty in 150 years? Yeah. Yeah. But uh, in, in states where they have these kinds of referendums, do they generally pass? Yeah. 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 I mean, most states have the death yeah. penalty. Now. And yet what, I, what most people don't realize is if you get the death penalty in your state, you're going to need millions and millions and millions of more dollars, right, to go to things like appeal. Oh, sure. Yeah. 
Death penalty is a very expensive proposition, isn't it? Yeah, well, that's why the same legislators who propose death penalties are the first ones to limit the rights of appeal. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> to reduce the expense. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Well, we're almost out of time here, but um, you know we've we've got um, a Green Party candidate um, running against um, Senator Herb Cole for the U.S. Senate seat. Um, Ray Vogler, uh, she was on our show a, a couple weeks back. Um, you know, third party candidate here. Do you think she's going to make some kind of a dent? Oh, I, I think that bottom line that she can look at 10, 15 percent of the vote and a lot of protest over being denied access to debates and the fact that she's being ignored. Unfortunately, third party candidates can at some times make a dent. Uh, Jesse Ventura, the, uh, the guy in Texas who's running, uh, former prominent elected official, Joe Lieberman running as independent, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. but um, uh, she's not a personality. Right. She, she, you know, she's not a... Um, I think her candidacy, though, will show how strong the opposition to the war is. It could. That's been her number one issue. The war seems to be very unpopular in Wisconsin, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And so she, I think she could make a strong dent there. I think she's a very interesting qualified candidate. I, I, I think the Senate would be better with people like her serving. Yeah. You know? Well, I, I, you know, when she was here, I really enjoyed um, our visit, and I know that you had met her, uh, you oh know, yeah. sometime before I that. But this well. was my first time meeting mm -hmm. her, and I, I just I found her to be very um, um, sincere. Mm -hmm. Her message very heartfelt, and um, I, I just I, I think she's a nice, fresh face. Yep, I agree. Um, on on the ballot. So, but now you had something very interesting on your website about, as Jim sort of alluded to, about her being denied um, a speaking engagement somewhere. Oh, well, at uh, Ed Garvey's Fighting Bob Fest in Baraboo, he's supposedly the great progressive. Yet, he no, he won't let the Green Party candidate for Senate or Governor speak. And so, I guess the Fighting Bob spirit doesn't uh, go, go <laughs> doesn't extend that far. <laughs> he doesn't want to hurt hurt Democrats, I guess. But. Uh, a couple of minutes left. Russ Feingold, is he going to run for president? Sure. Sure. Yeah. Okay. I can talked to him last night. Can he? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can he get through primaries? I think he can win some early primaries. Actually, uh, win primaries. Win early primaries. Ones where money is not the the big issue. Uh, you think Jim he can have the kind of organization needed to win those kinds of things? I mean. Uh, I would normally say he can't raise the kind of serious money necessarily mm -hmm. to continue a contest and uh, he'll quickly run out. He doesn't have the kind of name recognition or organization necessary to run a national campaign. On the other hand, the Democrats have changed the rules. Yeah, It's no longer you know, New Hampshire and Iowa. Now they've got uh, earlier contests, they're front-loading a uh, candidate that can catch fire early. Mm -hmm. Who knows? We've had the war is incredibly unpopular. Right. Yeah, it is. All right. You know? right. Well, very good. Well, thanks to both of you, yeah, it was fun. Jim and Dan, for being yeah. here. We're going to go to the Barrett to talk, and we're going to report back to you if you ever have us back on the <laughs> All show. All right, okay, that Jim? sounds great. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll be asking both of you to come back <laughs> at some point. Well, Dan, I think you, you need to sit, watch <laughs> both movies, <laughs> both, both screw <laughs> spare change. Thank you, and, uh, <laughs> and thanks to you there. folks at home, too, for <laughs> having us in your homes for the last hour. We'll see you next time. Until then, take good care and keep your eye on us. We've got our eye on Oshkosh.